Today is the sixth day of the May 86 retreat. Before getting into a topic, let me say something once more. It's kind of late in the retreat, but I'll say it anyways about um, sounds reaching the meeting room. There is the reception door and there are boards that lead to the outside. And there is crushed stone left and right of the boards at certain places. Would it be possible in stepping out of the boards to step really carefully and then proceed on the boards till, if possible, I haven't surveyed the situation completely. If there's grass available before, uh, before one gets on the stones, then please get on the grass. Also, maybe someone whose job are maintenance problems, check those boards. It sounds as though they're out of kilter. If somebody steps on the side, it comes down with a thump to, to stabilize those boards. But yet, even if they're stabilized, to, to not exactly tiptoe, but to walk lightly. They're several feet away from the window, but if one is sitting in there, and particularly during the evening, sometimes there's no wind, it's very still. The windows are wide open, and if the ears are also wide open, then it sounds as though somebody was standing right beneath the window when these stones <coughs> crush. There are, there are two people who are living in a tent with their children, it's all right to go, Doesn't, it's impossible for these people to make a long detour and make the rounds of sitting on time. And I've already noticed that um, these people are walking in the grass. Please uh, keep it that way. We had two questions left over yesterday, and already a few people have referred to them in meetings, and we will go into them together here this morning. One of them was, why, is, why are people sitting all the time in this room? Are they conditioned? my previous Zen center experience, a Zen experience. The other question was, when I look at a flower, here yeah, there's a little flower between the two cushions, when I look at this flower, I certainly see it differently from the way you see it. And out of this, comes this feeling of I-ness. No, that was not the way it was put. I don't remember how it was put. But something like, there is definitely a me and a you because I see this flower different from the way you do. And the people in the sitting hall don't see this flower at all. So obviously, they are also different. Something like that. And I think everybody is familiar with this problem to which one gets entangled and cannot, well, we'll do it later. <laughs> Why is everybody sitting, or whoever is sitting here for long periods of time? Actually, not everybody is sitting here all the time, if one observes the sitting room and regularly this is the case. Not everybody is sitting here all the time, but when one is sitting here for several periods a day or long periods of day or maybe even 
times of the night, why is one doing that? Is it because one has been conditioned to sit? Meaning, what does it mean to have been conditioned to sit? That one is doing this without any questioning, because it's the right thing to do. I think conditioned means one isn't questioning something. One is just doing it out of an impulse, one knows not where that comes from. And yet, the rightness of it is somehow felt, thought about. And with conditioned sitting goes that one does this in order to get something else. A calm, peaceful mind, a better character, a dropping away of physical, bothersome symptoms, or what was always mentioned at what is always mentioned at Zen centers, the ultimate of desire, enlightenment. Which is actually, openly, regarded as a lofty desire. to get enlightenment. I cannot answer for the people who are sitting here, why they're sitting here. So if one is really interested in this, one can talk to some people who seem to be sitting here for long periods of time, whether a discussion or a, a, a fruitful deepening discussion will come out of this. Depends on whether the person will wish to talk about it or... whether the other person wishes to listen. Openly. sitting that one is doing here, or maybe doing at times at home, is a relatively very, very rare occurrence among our human activities, including the activities of the people who are doing the sitting. Most of the time, during one's daily life, there's any, anything but quiet sitting even if one is sitting down in an office chair or there is constant doing and most of the time pressure to get done, get things done. We're a harried people, hectically, usually going from one thing to the next even under pressure to get to the movie on time, or to the bar, to a, to a party. And at these places usually surrounding ourselves with enormous input, the input of, of musical sound the amplitude is on, seems on the waxing all the time. It's louder and louder. I was at a wedding once. It was actually our, our son's wedding. And he was very much into drumming, into rock music, and there was the band of his choice there at the wedding. 
and had never really quite been that exposed. He'd, he'd been practicing at home a lot. But the resonance, the, the acoustics in that hall beat anything we had at home. <laughs> You could literally not talk to your neighbor. It was impossible. Or, or you noticed so quickly that you were ruining your vocal cords if you attempted to do that, so you just gave up. And I looked at the young people that were there, and there were more young people than older people. And without wanting to be the least bit critical. I'm just conveying what I perceived. There was a certain dullness of sitting there and ex being exposed to this, I don't know what to call it, sometimes sort of swaying with the rhythm. I'd say, wait a minute, how do you know the person felt dull? I don't. I just looked at faces. And having often talked to our son about this, he assured me that I did not understand what was going on, which was probably the truth. He said, you, it's not so much the music, it's to just feel all of these vibrations throughout your body. Is it that one without that does not feel vibrations throughout one's body? That one feels so numb so dead, so frightened, anxious, guilty, that this input is needed to drum up something in the organism. Coupled with that, the intake of alcohol, the uh, breathing in of smoke, <clears throat> what we do to ourselves during our times of relaxation and entertainment. And then, of course, driving back home from the place. Late, usually, the lack of sleep. And then the alarm in the morning and staying in bed as, as long as possible. I knew one person who had a shaver under his blanket. <laughs> <laughs> So, while still in half sleep, <laughs> a few more minutes garnered before getting out into this brutal cold world. Where one has to prove oneself if one is so employed to one's boss, to one's co-workers, and when one comes home, maybe to one's wife or husband, at least one thinks one has to do that. That one is successful, that one is okay, that one is on the rise, on the climb. Or that one is somebody. Or is on the, on the way to becoming somebody. This question is asked of already of little children. What are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to become? So the pressure starts right there. To have an answer that is impressive, that is well received.
I remember the first, the first promotion that Kyle, my husband, got, being a, getting a principalship. He had been a teacher. And immediately, relatives, people would ask, what, what, where can he go from there? Can he become the superintendent? We live under those pressures, they're in the air. Take them in by osmosis. Of course, the pressures to keep the house clean, to fix the house up, to mow the grass. There's always many, many more things than one can do. And we nag ourselves, are getting nagged to get things done. If we finally drop off to sleep, we may be nagged by heavy dreams. Sometimes pleasant dreams, very often not. And another day comes along. In, out, out of a life like this, somebody, for, for whatever reason, decides to sit down quietly for a while, maybe taking a week to sit down. What's so amazing about this? It is amazing if one compares it with the way we live. But in this 51 weeks of the year of rush and pressure and hurrying and input to the, at times to the breaking point, sensual, sensuous input, to, to take out a day, 20 minutes or a week, to sit still. I think it makes eminent sense. I'm not trying to say this to propagandize sitting. I, I don't, and I have been uh, asked why I don't do it more. To, to sit down and not move for a while, not even Move the eyeballs. Because the eyes want to make sure of security, familiarity, and danger. That's why they move and roll around all the time. And also for excitement to see something new and different. For approval to be sure that people think well of us, that we're impressive to them, that comes via the eyes. When these eyes are out of commission for a while, or at least when experiments, whether it's possible to live for a week or a portion of time with the eyes out of commission, not roving around for approval, security, familiarity, curiosity. And therefore, relieving the brain of associating with each visual impression what that is, trying to name it. And then we went through that yesterday quite, quite carefully, how the moment something is named, and here we start with the moment something is seen, it's named. <coughs> that naming already comes from, from the memory. You have to know this thing to name it. So the brain may have to scan, where do I know this bird from? What I, where do I know this flower from? Certainly right here at this moment, I may forget it later, doesn't mean 
the eye is out of commission when one takes a walk. There it is. Uh, if one looks around at a flower or a cloud or a tree, to see whether one can see, really see, or what, whether the, the brain is moving, knowing, associating, and therefore not seeing the flower. That was an aside. Where was I? If the eyes fall, see something, let's say, see another person, that person is looking at one in a certain way, their associations, is he interested in me? Or how, how advanced he looks? <laughs> <laughs> walks with such Zen absorption. <laughs> I, th I don't think we have that so much. I think we have seen through some of that stuff and, and been able to drop that. But it's quite clear that seeing something, naming it, and then the brain, it, it does it. it, it that's its function to associate, to scan, to bring up Memories, what this means? Does it mean pleasure or danger? Does it mean I'm secure? So with that not taking place, one can first of all, in sitting quietly, become aware of this process. That it is, <clears throat> when it is not operating, how one misses it, how one feels lost without it. insecure, unsure. Or, as one person put it, relieved of not having to worry what people think of one. Because one doesn't have to look at one and they don't look. One doesn't have to look at somebody and this person may indeed not look at me either. Relieved for a while of that pressure to put forth one's best image. And to see that, not just the relief, but to, to be, to discover that for oneself immediately, directly, not read it in psychology books or wherever. But notice it, come upon it. Many people have mentioned, you mention, you, Tony, talk about sitting without motive, but if there wasn't a motive, I would never have even come here. I wouldn't be doing this. Well, so what? Yes, the motive brings one here. I'm not saying have no motives, but can one observe motive, uncover it, unearth it? They're not just superficial motives. Some motives sit in the deepest recesses of the mind and will only reveal themselves if there is an open, fearless attention that will not shy away at anything to find out. People have said, isn't that a motive to try to find out? is when, at that moment, intellectually involved in this problem. And, and on that level, it is insoluble. But on the level of looking, it is not insoluble. One can, in sitting, discover one's motives. And see what happens when they are really, fully discovered. When there is insight into them whether a motive <clears throat> will keep operating compulsively or whether it is detected 
and therefore there is freedom from it. At least for the time of this awareness. Maybe for good, maybe something has been so, seen so thoroughly for what it does, for how it compels, how it enslaves, how it divides and isolates that if it ever comes up again, it is seen immediately and, and dropped or disempowered. The plug is pulled out from it. The energy will not go there. Not from repression or control, but out of, out of clarity of seeing. So no matter why one came here, what ideas one had about the place, about the work, this is the place if one is so inclined to open up the whole box of oneself. Not according to a plan, according to a blueprint or detailed instructions that one gets when one opens up a box and a piece of equipment has no instructions how to do it. The, the box does open up and things do come up when one sits quietly. And and wonders about this box that is oneself this black box or this story that one has lived and that one may still be living at this moment is still living the story of one's life to open it up to to insight that this seems to demand energies almost everybody has discovered, found out. We talked about it yesterday, how normally our energies go along well-greased channels, paths of dreaming, scheming, anticipating. And that when we do not live the way we live daily, exhausting, and our, exhausting our energies in hurrying here and there, living under pressure, seeking strenuous entertainment, lacking sleep and rest and quietness, the, the absence of sen sense input is already a tremendous uh, saving of nervous energy. One may find frightened without this input if one is so used to having uh, constant music or a radio commentary or whatever going all the time, then for that not to be there can put one into a real state of, of panic. Remember the, one of the first babysitters we had we had rented a large house. We got a very cheap, we had very little money at the time and only had an old clunker of a radio, which didn't really look like when it was a home-built job we'd gotten in the, the Goodwill. And even though we had prepared things for the babysitter that we know babysitters like, food and candy, and that radio we hadn't thought about, it was upstairs in one of the bedrooms. And when we came back and asked her how she had been doing, she said in the beginning it was a frightful experience to be in that house and not have a radio. And she looked all over and she found that little clunker and brought it down and it was going as we came in. We 
we already put our, often our babies to sleep to the sound of, of a radio. And obviously, if that isn't there sometime, then there must be great insecurity in this child, I would assume. So, not to have all this sense input, which even though it may seem soothing, or at least distracting from guilt and anxiety and fear and, and boredom, it at the same time taxes the nerves. We may not realize it, but it does. So from the absence of this kind of taxation, absence of pressure to perform well at the job, people do have jobs but there is no grade assigned or a rating of, of, of workers. There is, and from not talking, of course, the energy alone that we expend in our 24 hours or 18 hours a day of talking, talking, talking. Energy accrues just from the absence of all of those activities and occurrences and, and happenings. And one may be for the first time when one sits down become aware how chaotic this mind is. In, in California there was a man who had never been to any retreat. He had done a lot of discussing of how the mind works with a group of people. They meet regularly to discuss. And sitting in this retreat, he said it was just overwhelming to realize what actually goes on and how chaotic this mind is when one comes directly in touch with it, not just discusses about it. Then, one, then there is no awareness of what actually goes on, and then the mind is functioning in discussion. And all that goes on with that, who is maybe has the best point of view of all. I don't want to go into this right now, what goes on when we discuss. Not necessarily, but usually. So coming back to the question. Is one sitting because one has been conditioned by a Zen center that is for each one of us to open up? Let's say, a priori, no, I, I wasn't conditioned, or this was a good conditioning, what are, you, what are you finding fault with that for? One can do that, then, will one, not, then one will not look. But to, if, if there is an openness of no expectation, no, no pressure, no blueprint, not knowing, then our compulsions will come, in, come into view very colorfully, dramatically, our fears. And then what is the quality of attention? Pressure to get rid of the bad thoughts. Pressure to get to a quiet mind, to a still mind, to an enlightened mind. Which comes from our memory of what we've heard, read, been told, been indoctrinated in. Or will that itself, that pressure of in the looking, will that itself reveal itself, come into clear view? This is what is going on. So that every 
reaction and counter-reaction and counter-reaction reveals itself as the way that the mind and with it the body operates. And then wondering whether this is all there is to a human life. One person once told me, I respect what you say about the self and self-image, but I can't agree with it. There's, there is something to the self, there's much more to the self than what you point out. And in questioning what, what, what is it? What, is, what more is there? Can we talk about it? There was a certain hesitancy. The person that is hard to put in the words, but maybe the best word is that there is a soul. We're not just images and selfishness and fears and desires and memories. We also have a soul. on questioning <coughs> this person, what this soul was. She said she didn't know. But she was convinced it was there. Uh, see, if one has such a conviction, such a belief, Either one clings to it and wants to, to shelter it, shelter it from attack, from the breeze. It seems to blow away the shelter. Or that might blow away the shelter. One, one protects it because one, one needs it, one is attached to this belief of a soul. It gives one a good feeling, a hopeful, non-despairing feeling at the time of despair. One can believe in the soul that will, I don't know what, we didn't go into it. Survive, that's one characteristic of the soul, of course. It survives this body-mind. It will not die. So I don't have to be afraid ultimately of death because my soul will survive. Depending on one's radicalness of needing to investigate this human being here, this mind and body and soul, One will not accept any belief. No matter how lofty is it is, or no matter how dangerous it is to question it. If one has a belief in God, one may sense a real danger of questioning that. Maybe not here, nobody's going to do anything to one. This may be a much older fear because since one was little one may have been indoctrinated, indoctrinated with the existence of this God and the soul. They go together. A personal soul having a personal God. That God being at times very angry, very powerful, can smite you if you go against his wishes and ways, 
one may have discarded the stories and thinks one is through with it, but the fear is still there to question something like God or soul or that is reminiscent of it. But one can question the fear itself as nothing that is not open to questioning, including the fear of perishing in the process. Perishing as what? The soul thing reminds of a story that I used to read and was read to us at a Zen center about a, uh, a Japanese Zen teacher who as a little boy lost his father. He was there at the funeral and there were cakes on the altar and he asked the officiating priest, well, what are these cakes for? And the priest said, they're for your father. He said, well, my father's dead. He said, well, they're for his soul. So, this man who wrote his own biography says, or did he have a biographer? I don't know. If my father has a soul, I being his son must also have a soul. <coughs> if I do have a soul, I must be able to, to find it, to come upon it, to see it. So let me find out if I have a soul. I want to discover this thing. This to him was a, a fascination probably at the beginning. One can imagine to a little boy a soul that can eat cakes. <laughs> without a body, without a mouth. What is that? And I have that in me. What is it? Let me uncover it. And he spent years and years and years looking for the soul, or for this, later he called it the master. What is the master? Always having this feeling there's something in me that sees, there's something in me that hears, there's something in me that sees this flower, and this something is different from the something in you that sees the flower. We're still feeling the same feeling of having something in us that's more than just this body and brain. Brain is the body. But to him it was not an assumption or conviction or belief which he rested with comfortably, but it was in, it incited to, to investigation, to questioning. And to find out what it is that we have in ourselves, that, what, that is this feeling of meanness, me, I, myself, to find that out, what that is, one has to start observing, listening, looking, questioning, and sitting quietly, or standing, or walking quietly. as well as observing in relationship what it is that gets hurt when somebody criticizes us, what it is that gets flattered when somebody praises us, what it is that gets angry, <coughs> question it at all times, to come upon what it is that seems <coughs> to be the separate self or soul or meanness, the sense of individuality. One can hear somebody talk about it clearly, carefully, repeatedly. 
but it's, that still remains words, descriptions. And if somebody says there is no hearer, hearer and what is heard and the process of hearing is, is all one. Somebody can say that very emphatically, repeatedly, convincingly. But this has to be understood or seen, experienced directly. The person with whom I was talking about the soul and to whom I was telling the same story I was telling right now about Vasui in a search for his soul. She said, well, what did he find? And the answer that was given was nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. Which at that point means everything. but not with me in there as the center. The idea of me. As an imagined center. There's no denying the fact that if you sit here, I sit here, and there is a flower between us. And it looks different from where you sit, and it looks different from where I sit. We may exchange places, and then we've turned it the other way around. We're not talking about that kind of seeing. And even that kind of seeing does not depend on thinking that I see it. It just happens. To say I see that is something that the brain adds as a description. Do you see that? That a perception takes place, and there are all kind of processes, physiological, optical, going on. <clears throat> but when one says, I see that, other than just descriptively, the thing is seen here rather than there, for sake of communication, when it's for more than the sake of this, this kind of communication, to establish one's separate individuality, that is a contribution of the brain with its probably infinite storehouse of memories, infinite memories. 
images. Aspirations, fears, wishes, desires. And that we all share. Your desires may be a little bit different from desires here, maybe differently colored through, due to our different upbringing, different social setting, but desires there are. And how they function, that something is seen, imagined, thought, projecting oneself having that, and then the drive to get it, that is universally true for everybody. <clears throat> or the fear, which involves memory of what has happened or what could, what could happen. That's universally true for everybody. It's the same brain that we all have. It's evolved. We don't know how long. There are estimates about it. Where does this laying individual claim to something come in? And what is involved with it? It's my brain. We like to particularly say it when it's very clever. <laughs> Tremendous capacities or talents. But who is the owner of it? Is that owner separate from that brain? Owning it? Separate from the soul, owning that, whatever the soul may be? If so, we must be able to discover this owner. which, for which we have to start observing the qualities of this owner. When does this owner spring into action? And what is the, what is the action at that moment? Where does it take place? Thoughts are observable. That's, that's the beauty of it. They are not <clears throat> ephemeral occurrences which are not detectable. Is this ownership a thought? Is the soul a thought, an idea? Don't say yes, don't say no, find out. And what is there when thought quiets down? What do we have in us when the words are quiet? when there are no words, then what is there within us? And to be sure that one is clear, when one posits that something is within one, that one can differentiate between a word and what is not a word. or a thought. Word and thought I'm using interchangeably.
in listening right now? Are these words? We will end here for today.